assume that there's something don't. You'll also know on your screen that it's just uh, hinted that you've got uh, a recording in process. If you have any issues about being identified, turn your camera off. Um, but hopefully you've all acknowledged that this uh, roundtable discussion is being recorded and may well end up on social media or being put out. So um, please be aware of that. So I'll just give you a quick update now before I introduce our speakers. I'll introduce them as they come to speak rather than at the start. And, and I'll give you a little background now to the Police Crime Sentence and Courts Bill, which I think we can all agree is with its tremendously broad scope uh, represents one of the most serious threats to human rights and civil liberties in recent history. And <laughs> there've been a lot of those over the last 10 or 15 years. And, and this one uh, is perhaps one of the, the most significant. Um, it hands the police and the Home Secretary sweeping new powers, including the power to restrict protest rights. Now, what, what's in the bill undermines gypsy and travellers nomadic way of life. We'll be hearing more from a speaker on that in a little while, and also provides a basis for expansive police-led data gathering, retention and sharing. Now, this gets around existing safeguards and establishes expansive new stop and search powers that threaten to entrench racial discrimination and the root causes of serious violence. I'm just going to talk through the kind of key parts of the bill, um, which I think will affect uh, us in terms of the issues that we're discussing today and what some of the speakers will touch upon. So in part two of the bill, we know that while supporting to be a public health multi-agency approach to tackling serious violence, the proposed serious violence duty in the bill would risk further criminalizing communities over addressing root causes by being police-led and enforcement driven. Uh, the provisions that mandate data sharing between different agencies with minimal safeguards have the potential to breach individual data rights and their right to a private life. And the creation of carve outs for professional duties of confidentiality and other restrictions on, on disclosure and of information would erode relationships of trust between frontline professionals and the individuals they work with and hinder the provision of vital services such as health and social care and education. Um, and the practices of the extensive data sharing with minimal safeguards may give rise to individual risk profiling and targeting, which is likely to entrench racially disproportionate policing and structural inequality. Effectively, this duty risks putting the systemic failures of the gangs matrix on a statutory footing. Um, I'm going to talk very quickly about part 10, and, and then I think, um, and maybe a little bit about part four, We'll all be up to speed then, and then I'll hand over to our first speaker. So the serious violence reduction orders will compound the discrimination faced by marginalized communities, particularly black men, young women and girls, and exacerbates the disparities that already exist throughout the criminal justice system. SVROs will be able to be imposed on people on the basis of a de facto joint enterprise or guilt by association measure. People subject to, or who police believe are subject to, an SVRO are likely to face intrusive monitoring. And SVROs may also plunge people into cycles of criminalization. I think what I'll do is I'll leave part four for our final speaker who will give a bit more information on that, but I'll leave it there. And I wanna come now on to our first speaker. Um, and uh, that is uh, Katrina French. She's the director of Unjust. It's a not-for-profit organization that challenges discriminatory practices and policies within UK policing and the wider criminal justice system. I've heard you speak before, you're a very good speaker and I hand over to you now to uh, enlighten us about how this bill would affect um, various communities here today. Thank you, Clive. I really want to start by really commending the coalition for bringing us all together and the attendees this afternoon. It's wonderful to see so many people taking an interest in not just the work that we're doing as a coalition, but also in listening to the people who are most likely to be impacted by the police crime sentence in courts bill. I think the event is well named in terms of impact of racialized and minoritized communities. And it's really important that we recognize that whilst it's the law of the land, it will disproportionately impact certain groups. And and black communities, gypsy traveller groups are already overrepresented, over, overrepresented in the criminal justice system. And this bill, unfortunately, seeks to, to increase that overrepresentation. And I think in many ways, there's an acknowledgement that it does so. And there's a flagrant 
audacity that that's quite okay in the 21st century for certain communities to expect that legislation will be passed and that they will be at the brunt of it. We've seen over the last year, year and a half, in terms of protests, how gypsy traveller communities have been continuously targeted. We've seen how in terms of black communities going out for Black Lives Matter have been continuously targeted. And we're really fearful that without a strong coalition that exists outside of a policy world, we won't be able to have the changes that we need. So this event today is really about amplifying the voices of those that are impacted and understanding it isn't just a policy issue, it's a reality issue. Um, Clive did a fantastic job touching on the, the, the two parts and I, I really want to draw on the, the sharing of information firstly because we do have the evidence of the gangs matrix work that I have advocated on for a good few years now in terms of why we don't need legislation or practices and policies that actually aren't evidence-based. And when we have legislation already in place, which is substantial and sufficient to do the sharing of information, why would we want to overburden our professionals? So it's not just about the young people or the racialized minorities being impacted. There's a question here about public sector bodies being asked to do more when actually what they're being asked to do will actually undermine their positions of trust with the same people they seek to be serving. So I think that bit about sharing of information is incredibly important. And we need to understand how that really does connect to how serious violence reduction orders will be given in terms of part 10. So we see that the government accept that stop and search is disproportionate. It's also kind of quite accepted or well regarded that it doesn't do the efficacy that it should be doing in terms of outcomes. However, we see legislation being proposed that will see, let's just be frank, more young black males entering the criminal justice system by sus suspicionless stop and search. And if there's anything we've seen about suspicionless stop and search is that it does more harm than it, than it does good in terms of people who are carrying knives, unfortunately, are less people that are carrying, sorry, one minute. Joys of working from home. Um, people that are carrying, ca carrying knives definitely need to be reprimanded, but what we need is an evidence-based approach to doing that. And we don't want to be criminalizing or targeting populations and yes it's black populations but what we'll see in this is specific areas so it's about geography as well you'll find inner city inner city areas being over police high concentration of police and not feeling that there's a public service there to protect them but one that's there to penalize them not because of their individual actions but because of actions of people with the same color skin or the same age group or that go to the same school so I think we really have to unpick how insidious the legislation is but also how damaging it it will be. And in terms of part four, it's wonderful that we have Chelsea on the call because I think far too often gypsy traveler communities are left out of the conversation. Um, we're having to, they're having to mobilize on their own. I think the wonderful thing about this bill, if there's anything wonderful in it, is that it's brought us together. And reading what's happening under part four with the unauthorized encampments and the criminalization of trespass is incredibly worrying because it no longer, it's, it's in many ways much, more insidious than the first two parts because this is about people's way of life. So if a caravan is your home, a vehicle is your home and now it can be seized, where are you meant to live? So there's a, you, there's a wholesale attack on racialized and minoritized communities. And I'm gonna stop speaking in a minute because I'm really looking forward to having the people who are directly impacted by this, whether they're professionals working with young people or young people themselves um, experiencing this sort of policing or having had experiences of similar sorts of policing, I think it's really important we, we give the floor to them and, and we hear what they have to say. My call to everybody here is that they should be getting behind policy coalitions, but equally when there are op op opportunities for people to do some sort of direct action, I'm not asking people to go and do things that are illegal, although it seems everything in this bill will be illegal soon. But whilst we still do have those rights, let's stand in solidarity with one another. Let's do what we can. And what we can do is listen to these young people about what unfortunately we have to look forward to if this bill is enacted. So I think we're gonna have a, an insightful afternoon um, and I'm going to pass back over to Clive now. Thank you everybody. I'm really looking forward to hearing from, from everybody at the table. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for taking the time as well. It's much appreciated. Um, I, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Stefan, um, who is a new genera generation worker uh, at Revolving Doors. Um, if I can quickly explain, um, new generation campaigners are, are basically young, young adults uh, with lived experience 
of the criminal justice system uh, who work alongside revolving doors in their new generation policing project. So I think um, we look really forward to hearing what you've got to say, Stefan. And um, yeah, tell us, tell us your perspective on this bill, what it will mean to you, your experience of it, uh, and your, your reflections on it as well. So I leave it. I put the, I leave the floor open to you now. My my experience of it is section sixty doesn't work because it's not solving the problems. Because the if you take one knife of the street, ten more goes back onto there. So it's not fixing the problem. It's only going to create more anger in that community. So what you're basically going to be doing that the last bit of bread of any type of relationship that the community have with the police. It's going to trample all over it because as you already know it's already a heightened state where people don't like the police from the community and people don't want to report crimes because nine times out of the ten they think police are shady and they're not doing their job properly and to be black is just to have a suspicion you don't have to be doing nothing wrong you just got to be black to just be suspicious I could be walking down the alleyway with a briefcase, but because of the color of my skin, I would get judged on that. They would ask me all types of questions. And Section 60 just gives them more power to put their hands on people. And when you put your hands on someone, you're creating anger. You're creating more anger. So it's word of mouth. Someone else is going to tell someone else. Then before you know it, it's going to go around and it's tension in the community. So. I really believe like, and it creates a stigma on that person as well. And it makes someone, and it makes someone not wanna trust the police. If you've been, if you've been dealt with the police in that type of formal way, you would understand what I mean. When they put their hands on you, they do, they do use excessive force. And it's not nice to a common person. It's not nice for someone to come up this house every single day and be stopped like that when you're not doing nothing, then it makes you think, why not? Why, why, why by certain rules if this is only gonna happen? Because innocent people get stopped as well. And the way they get dealt with, that changes their perspective on the police. So if they was to get robbed or if they was a major crime was to happen to them, they're not gonna report it because the trust is gone because of, because of that, that, that stigma that you put behind that person, the trust is gone. So what I believe what the, what the police should be doing is asking how could we build it, not putting out a bill on how to enforce more stop and searches and how to trample, trample all over people's rights, because I don't think it's fair. I think it's abuse of power. And I feel, and I feel like it's gonna even make things more worse in the community to, a point where we ain't gonna be able to build nothing. We're gonna be all sitting here having conversations for no reason because it's gonna be at a point where the community ain't gonna listen. They don't already wanna to listen to you right now. So why don't you change that from now and stop adding more pain onto whatever's happened because it's a crisis down there. People are begging for people's help. And the help that we're receiving is in the bill of a section 60. It doesn't make sense. Stephen, can, can I ask you a question to come on to back of that, if that's all mm -hmm. right? I mean, what do you think, what do you think the com your community needs to tackle violent crime? It's clearly not this bill. So what is it that you need? My, what, what, what my community needs is affordable housing, is, is activities for the kids, is jobs, is, is everything. It takes a village to, um, to raise a kid. So everyone needs to come together and put, put their two pence in so they can raise the kid to not want to give him other opportunities that he can see himself doing. Stop taking the money, stop taking the funding out of the youth clubs and all the activities that when kids are off school or if they don't, if they got excluded, that create places like that, create safe places for people to go to. Can I ask another question, if that's all right, Stefan? Thank yeah. you. Can I ask you why, what you think parliamentarians in the media, are they asking the right questions? Do you think that they're, they're learning the right lessons? No, they're not. You may be, uh, uh, 
I believe um, parliamentarians, they, they ask the questions but do nothing with, with the answers. That's what I believe because how many times have you sat, sat and asked people, what do we need to do different? How many times have you had debates in the House of Commons and asked what needs to go on? How many times has someone's parent been crying on TV saying they need the help? So I think that it's gone past of asking, why don't we just do now? Um, is there anything else that you want to add to your contribution? Is there anything else you want to say? Anything else you want us to kind of take away from this? Uh, you schools need to be looked in as well because that's a very important place if the child's not in school well where, where, where else is he going to be you're going to be pushing their them into the groomer's arms and what you don't realize is every time a child gets excluded where does he go he goes to the streets he ain't supposed to be he's supposed to be in school at those times so when he's, when he's on the streets, he's going to meet older people that are going to show him flashy things that are going to want to get him involved in that lifestyle. So I think school exclusions should be cancelled because it's a child's future. And you're only creating a problem for society in the coming years. That's, that's what's going to happen. You're going to be forking out more money to fix the mistake. So why don't you just fix it in the first place and don't make it happen. Yeah. So can I ask Stefan, how important, you were talking then about the community, about schools, how important are teachers, youth workers, those who have that positive relation with the community, often they're the, they have been at the brunt of cuts to our communities. How important, I mean, obviously it's the leading question, but how important are they to, for example, reducing um, uh, the likelihood of knife crime to reducing uh, criminal intent to stop people from being groomed. What part do they, what role do they play and what can be done to improve how they can help? They, they, they play a very important role because that's like the doorstep. Like if you're in the community and you say you work in a youth club or you work in a school or you're going to see this kid every single day. So you're going to start to see things going wrong. And I really think that if they had more funding, it's all about funding. When you cut someone's funding, someone ain't, then the work that was supposed to happen ain't going to happen. The child that you was meant to save, you ain't going to save him because there's not enough money. That's the question. That's the thing that always gets said in these areas. There's not enough funding. And when there's not enough funding, people don't get paid enough as well. I feel, I feel like they need to be paid more as well. Because sometimes these jobs ain't paying enough for people wanting to apply to it. Sorry, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you one more question. So they are helpful, they are useful, they do make a difference. Is there any more that they could be doing? I mean, for example, like there are teachers and, and youth workers there already. Is there anything else that they could be given apart from resource, what could they be doing? Um, what more could they be doing if they had that resource? Um, therapy, different things, is different things that can help. I mean, someone that gets into that lifestyle of knife crime and these things, they're coming from a place of trauma. So you need to add something in there to work, to help them work on their trauma to help them be the best possible person they can be, to show them that you're actually interested into their future. Mm -hmm. Stefan, I'm, I'm gonna bring Anthony in now and, and let Anthony, Anthony's also another new generation worker at Revolving Doors, uh, who has lived experience of this. I take it you two know each other. Um, I let Anthony, um, Anthony, if you just wanna kind of say a few words, if there's any questions I've got, maybe some similar questions there, I'll, I'll ask them. And, and, and Stefan, if you want to listen to what Anthony says, and if there's anything you want to kind of bounce off from what he said, if he's, if he's triggered something or he said something that you want to react or respond to, then, then, then just let me know and come back in, all right? Let's have a conversation. So Anthony, you're on a phone, I know, but thank you for joining us. Do you just want to kind of say your kind of opening remarks and thoughts on, on how this bill will impact uh, you and your community? Um, can I get the full question so I can answer it properly to the best of extent, please? 
Yeah, Anthony, so this bit is coming in. Um, it's going to have a, a real impact. We just heard from Stefan on the, the people in that community. He's outlined what he thinks needs to happen if we're to kind of tackle this in a different in a different way. Um, he's told us how it will criminalize people, how it will make black people more prone to stop and search to criminalization. I just wonder what your take on this bill was. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. My general understanding of the bill is that um, obviously there will always be crime, but um, there will always be uh, ethnicity that will always be looked upon by the police. So um, if I'm correct, like that bill is not really, how am I supposed to say, um, it's not really looking out towards the BAME and ethnic communities, if you actually think about it. It's just going to create more tension from, we're going to set it from school level, from primary school level, all the way up to sixth form and potentially college kids and um, uni dropouts and all that. So it could potentially affect the next set of new generations that are potentially going into our workforce. With uh, young people and these new bills, you said that information will be shared with all the relevant agencies, if I'm correct, right? Yeah. Now, um, with certain information, some young people do not like their information being spread across. So um, I do know that all professional legal teams work together, i.e. social services, school teachers, um, and other legal services that are, are there for young people. I think it will have a, a general negative impact within the community. Do you think, Anthony, do you think the Syrians' violence duty will mean that that confidentiality, that, that level of trust that people had, we were hearing just now that, that there was a level of trust that was there, that they are the people on the, on the doorstep, uh, was how it was described uh, just now. Do you feel that this will have a, an impact on that, that ability for people to seek help, um, to build yes. successful relationships? I would, I would feel like the relationship would be strained. It's like having a cup of tea, but without a tea bag. So you'll basically have hot water. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Someone note that down because that was. I might use that. That one. Um, so, so, so I would say that the relationship would be strained because when you don't have trust within a relationship, any sort of scratch or any sort of hair, sort of tingling sensation will immediately give you a knee-jerk reaction. And I'll give you an example. So stop and search will be that knee-jerk reaction. Sharing information about young people, even if it's a joint enterprise or anything like that, their information and profile uh, will still be passed on. Not all young people who are within a group are actually gang members. And, and uh, the relevant authorities need to understand this. That's and not all, all... Oh, sorry, go on. No, 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 you carry on. I'm listening. <laughs> Um, and relevant authorities need to understand that the kids that are predominantly in gangs came from people, from, from homes that were in care, from broken homes, but predominantly young people in care are what makes up gangs. And the police need to understand they are part of the reason why that young person is on the street. Yeah. Because so they're taking them away from one safe, or one, what they call a safe haven from their parents' house to a different house where they could potentially not have the order and law to actually succeed in life. And then we're going to have this revolving door of this keep going on. You can throw as many bills onto the table, but the question is, is the public going to digest and accept them? That's my question to you. Yeah. So, so let's, let's look at the issue of, of knife crime and, and, and violence. What does, yeah. what does the community, what does you, what does that community need? What are the communities? affected by this disproportionately affected by this what do they need what, well, what yeah it's not what we need it's how are we going to tackle the problem it's not what we need you can give us leisure centers it doesn't mean young people are going to go to them you can bring a horse to water it doesn't mean it's going to drink you can send how much funding to local boroughs and local constituencies it does not mean the young people will turn up to that event am i not correct hmm. So, so as that's kind of physical resources, but in terms of like, we all know, for example, that if you, don't, if you, if you've got a youth, if you've got a youth program, but no youth center, it's a bit like, as you said, a, a cup of tea without the tea bag. I, I guess there are yeah. resources that are required. I mean, is that obviously what Stefan was saying before was that we, you know, he was talking about housing. He was talking about jobs. 
he was talking about re resources for the community that have been sucked out. I guess it's like, I agree, I assume you would agree with that. Is there anything else you feel? And it's not I just, would agree, uh, but the question is, is we're looking at, we're looking at, I, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not the type of person to think I'm more of a realist. So l l let's be quite frank here. We're in COVID, right? Tell me where we're getting the money for new housing and all of this and all of that. Knife crime is going to continue until COVID's over. We're going to be quite frank here and quite straight. So there, there, there's not really going to be an issue to solve, uh, what you call it, knife crime until COVID sorted out because there's still legislations and still things that are allowing young people to get around. Wearing a mask is basically helping these young people stab each other because police can't identify who's stabbing who. Um, can I, obviously, the, the other question I asked, Stefan, was sure. the take on, how, what's your view on how parliamentarians, the media, their take on this, on this conversation, are they, are they having the right conversations? I mean, I, I no. already know the answer to that, but you can tell me anyway. No, we, I'll be quite frank. Um, we live in two different worlds, them and us. And... A parliament, uh, unless they live in a constituency, it's very rare that they will actually see what happens in their constituency. You ask any of those MPs, have you ever visited your constituency more than five times a year? That's all you know. And the media? The media is, uh, uh, how am I supposed to say, the media is like a, a, a Jenga block. They'll always add something on top to make it seem worse than what it actually is. It's always... How am I supposed to say? It's always over-exaggerated. That's why I don't really watch the news. Mm. Do you think it helps any analysis to the general public about why these things are happening? It's simple. Some of the figures that are put on the news are exaggerated. Some of the crime statistics and all of that are false. So what, what can I really say is the news is correct most probably about 10% of the time. Okay. I mean, I will just add in there that there are, there are good journalists and there are good parliamentarians, but as I think, so I think that would be my one point to make to you. There are people in here that care, but probably maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't want people to come away from this thinking that we're all tired with the same brush, but a hundred percent the bulk maybe. Oh, of course not. No, no, no. In the general opinion of MPs obviously is a bit lax from uh, uh, where I come from. There's a lot of hostility towards local MPs because what, what's going on is they're building housing but this housing is not affordable. Yeah. Yeah. So, like I said, I'm gonna, uh, I have to agree to disagree with Stefan. There can be housing built, but is it affordable for the young people? Is it affordable for the mums who are single? Is it affordable for the dads who are single? Is it affordable for the right community at the end of the day? Yeah. I think Stefan would have meant that. I think Stefan meant accessible housing. Yeah. Your point is, is well taken. That has to be affordable. Yeah. It has to be council housing or it has to be social housing it has to be housing that's affordable um there's no point in not being is there anything else that you want to add is there anything else stefan that you want to come in on what's been said clive i don't know if stefan's here but before he does i just wanted to kind of kind of ground what anthony was saying in some of that distrust of the media mm -hmm. because when you hear you see the perception of all young boys, black boys being involved in knife crime. And you know, it's a fallacy because we've heard of young white boys being in knife crime, but it doesn't get the same splash on the news. Or even when there are, um, you know, white on white crime or black on black crime, however, you know, dog tail, dog whistling. It's people like Anthony that, as uh, Stefan said, get viewed with that suspicion. So it's very difficult to decipher what is true, what is false. And I was really glad that you did kind of rebut and say there are fantastic journalists. But if you're a young black boy, that's not the perception you get of yourself from them so people and then you have parliamentarians obviously not yourself because you've been so kind to put on this meeting but then we'll repeat the same dare I say tosh that they've read in the media so it becomes a very vicious cycle between people in power knowing their power and challenging the media or then using their power to reaffirm what the media says and it's people like Anthony that kind of sit sit at the bottom of that pyramid and are having to deal with the fallout so I, I can kind of hear the disdain it's it's because the system isn't fair and that where do you get a voice if you're somebody who's young black where where do you have that power outlet other than spaces like this so I think Anthony's point was um really strongly put in terms of why he's suspicious around media and what they report because he's one of those people that everyone would say what's your handbag from 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm Anthony, Stefan, is there anything else that you want to add before I move on to our next speaker? No, thank you. Uh, Stefan? Stefan, I assume that's yeah, um oh. I just want to say one more thing. And the bill that's coming out as well is going to affect the link between a teacher and a kid because the kid's not going to want to trust the teacher no more. Because if they're going to be telling the police information, why, why are we going to come to you and open our hearts and tell you what's really going on? Because we're going to feel like we're entrapping ourselves. It's just going to be like a police station interview. You might as well just say no comment because anything that's going to come is going to go straight back to them. Yeah. And that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous because a lot of kids are going to stop. A lot of kids are going to stop wanting to go to school because it's going to just feel like a prison. It's, like I see you already, it's going to be feeling like a prison because if a child has a problem that he's going through, if he's going through a serious problem like he's in danger or something, or something's happening, a child wants to feel safe. He wants to know that he, he can come to you without you going to the police and telling them the information, then the police coming back and arresting them. So I really think it's a dangerous thing that, that is happening. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Stefan, Andy, don't go away. I can see there might be a few questions. We're a little bit ahead of time. So I, I, I wouldn't mind. I, I'm just kind of looking to see whether there are any other MPs on this call. I know there are people from, I know there are offices. I'm just looking around to see whether there are any MPs. I can see a hand up from a non-MP from Kerry Law. Kerry, do you want to come in? Because it, 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 I imagine it's something relevant to what Anthony and Stefan are saying. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say what Stefan was saying. Um, I'm a criminology student and I was thinking about this for, um, this bill. And I think what Stefan said about breaking the trust between a student and a teacher is really, really important. Because this is what David Lammy said with the Lammy report about what happens when black people are disproportionately stopped by the police all the time. It breaks the trust that black people have with law enforcement. And then when there is crime in racialized, minoritized people's communities, people are less likely to trust the police. And then you end up with communities with more crime. And this is the same problem in America. And there is a failure to solve black people's homicides in the States, like in Chicago, in Baltimore, in Detroit, because of such mistrust in law enforcement. But then it further entrenches socioeconomic marginalization and further compounds the mistrust that black people feel towards law enforcement because then there is a failure to solve black people's crimes. So I do think this bill is really, really dangerous and I do think it is really, really frightening and it will just entrench and crystallize institutionalize racism. Thank you, That's Kerry. That was a really say. important uh, that was a really important uh, point you've made there um, into the debate and the conversation. Uh, I'm just going to say that Sir Peter Bottomley, who's a Conservative MP and a, a long-time friend of the, uh, of the APPG on race and community, was here very briefly. And I can see some messages say that he did want to come in and we were busy talking. So I do apologise because it would have been really interesting to have heard, heard his perspective um, from the government party and also his uh, reflections on what Stefan and Anthony had said. So I, I do apologise. I didn't bring him in earlier. I believe he's gone to another meeting now. He may come back and I'll keep an eye out for him. Is there anyone else that wanted to, to take part at this stage of the conversation? We've got time. Does anyone else want to raise a point? Uh, I'm going to look for hands up or just kind of come in, uncut your mic and come in. No? Okay. Well, I'm, what I'm going to do, Stefan and Anthony, don't go away because you. The, the, I think this conversation uh, is now going to move into a slightly different area, but one nonetheless I think um, you'll enjoy. And I, I, I really wanted to thank you for stepping up and speaking. It's not easy. Uh, I think some, some of us, myself included as an MP, take it for granted that you can walk into a room or on a Zoom call and talk. Um, thank you for expressing yourself so clearly and eloquently uh, and in a very revealing way. Uh, it's certainly given me some things to think about and I hope others here from MPs offices who are taking notes will feed that back to members of parliament. Um, so thank you once again for your contributions. It's really appreciated and valued. Um, I'm now going to move to uh, our, our final speaker, who is Chelsea McDonough, and she's a researcher 
uh, an Irish traveller activist and writer, and she speaks on a range of issues affecting gypsy and traveller people who are going to be very much affected by this bill. So Chelsea, if you'd like to speak now uh, and, and engage with us, and, and maybe I'll have some questions for you at the end, if that's OK. Over to you. That's fine. I think I think it's worth pointing out that this bill is is symptomatic of a society that promotes individualism. You, when you heavily promote individualism so much, you get to a point where people are so disconnected from others because you've just been you you've been forced on this path. And I think for me, I've spoken on this I don't know coming up hundreds of times I think um, over the last couple of years. You cannot legislate your way out of problems caused by legislation. We're in this position because of legislation, whether it's about travellers, black people, whoever it is, it's caused by legislation. And I, you know, unfortunately, I don't fall into this idea that politicians are unaware or that the media are unaware. They're aware and they know what they're doing. Um, this government was very happy to um, admit that they know that this bill will disproportionately affect travellers, it will disproportionately affect black, black people, and they don't care. Um, it's nothing new. I'm having the same conversations my grandmother had 20 years ago. And the only difference is that she's dead. Nothing has changed. I'm, I'm having the same conversations. And it, it's so tiring. Like if we look at if we look at policy in relation to travelers, it, it can be understood in one of two ways. It's either problematization, which we see in the areas of housing and criminal justice, um, or the areas of education and healthcare, we see complete silence. Um, and this has been, you know, I have sat in, in, in policy meetings with different government departments and it, it produces nothing. Um, sometimes you get the line of, you know, oh, there's not enough research, there's tons. Um, we're, we're getting the same things. We have enough bills, we have enough, all of this. You know, this bill is incredibly dangerous. It's already, as a traveler living in this society, um, you know, often you're told, you know, if you if you contribute to society, if you volunteer, if you do all of those things, then you won't experience discrimination. But that isn't what happens. You know how I'm caught. You know, if I put on my English accent and I sound, um, you know, I sound a bit like I went to private school. I don't I don't get an issue. I don't have issues. Um, when I experience policing on the side, that's different. Um, the tone, the way in which you're approached is different. All of those things that, that the speakers that have already spoken, Stefan and, and Anthony have said, I completely understand. Um, you know, I wouldn't advocate any traveller to join the police. Um, the ones that are in there at the moment are treated awfully. Um, so I'm not sure why they do it. It hasn't worked for other communities. It's not going to work for us. Um, you know, this bill, the bills that have come in relation to travellers and housing already are problematic. So this bill just further cements it. So it'll ban people from an area for up to six months. Um, sorry, up to 12 months, six months, you can be up to six months imprisonment, um, the seizing of people's homes and, and cars, and a camp, a camp, uh, one vehicle and one trailer is enough to constitute an encampment. Um, and you don't actually have to set up an encampment, you just have to have, the police just have to believe you have the intent. And language is clever, and this is where the media play into it, because um, I, I think language is great, right? Because it's all about how you frame things. So, you know, is it, anyone could have the intent. You just have to believe that. Um, if you're already over policed, then I'm pretty sure the police think that anyway. Um, and, and people don't quite understand that the policy surrounding traveler sites is, is very loose. Um, the reality is it's nimbyism. No one wants travelers living next door to them. Um, we have very few local authority sites. There's something like 2000 people on a waiting list for something like 50 pitches. You know, the, the issues that are affecting travel housing, people don't realize it ties into the issue affecting housing for, for everyone. And the problem is that the largest percentage of land is owned by the smallest minority of people. Um, people, you know, ho hoarding homes, I think is how I would describe it. All of those things, they're the same issues. Where I live, you have four generations living in, in single households. Um, and this, these numbers are increasing, but there's nowhere else for us to go. Under the government, the government then plan, changed the planning definition. So for someone like me who, you know, I've lived on the same site in, in Peckham my whole life, um, I don't count as a traveler under the government's planning definition because um, I need to be traveling for a set amount, a set number of months a year. But if I do that, I cannot be resident on a site. Um, 
because that you'd be breaching the terms of your, your tenancy. Um, you also then can't do that under this bill, um, which means then that you couldn't buy land and get planning permission because you don't count as a traveler under planning definition. It's a catch-22, it's perfect policy. It's perfect policy by a government that is happy to stitch people up. And for me, um, I see this across party. I am, I am over electoral politics. Uh, you know, two years ago at one point, I campaigned heavily. Now, I'm like, people don't even bother, what's the point? Um, because we're having, and that's sad, right? Because I'm having the same conversations. I haven't seen, I couldn't tell you when I ever saw my local MP. I know who she is, um, haven't seen her. No one does, we don't have that engagement. And this is, you know, like I'm one of those people, I'm educated, I'm able to engage with them, they still don't engage. This bill is gonna have wide ramifications and, and what other people said about um, think people like teachers becoming a front line um, for the police, we're gonna see that in, in, in healthcare as well. So the so, so healthcare professionals become a frontline service um, in a system that already incarcerates people. Travellers are six to seven uh, six to seven times more likely to take their own lives than anybody else. And people don't reach out for help because the help that, that you're offered is a system that incarcerates people. We're, we're stuck in the same cycle, but it's like no one wants to, to think about, how, you know, to actually step back and go, you know what, we've been doing it wrong. And I understand why the way travellers live is a threat to, to society as a whole. You know, we, we live as extended family units. I've been brought up, like, I see my grandparents, I, well, my granddad, my nan passed away. I see him every day. I see my parents every day. I see my siblings every day. I see my nieces every day. You have a, so when someone mentioned like it takes a village, that's how we view childcare. Um, I have seven nieces and nephews, uh, two that were born last night. We've never had to access, we, we've never had to go pay for childcare because why would you do that when the village, the family does that for you? It's, it's a, and it's misunderstood. And I think when it comes to planning policy, the way travellers, I can see how it's misunderstood in policy because it isn't necessarily about the trailers. It's about a lifestyle. It's about it's, it's about a way of being that's different to that mainstream. Um, and that's, you know, it, I'm t I can't even tell you how tired I am of talking on the issue because the bill was going through from the very beginning. The, the this government did a consultation on it um, and it was from a language perspective the best consultation I've ever seen because whichever way you answered it produced policy agreement as, as a, an effect um, I just I don't really know where to go with it um, yeah I'm over it I think you're <laughs> good I can ask you a couple of questions Chelsea if that's alright thank you for that I really appreciate that um, and I think everyone would have been uh, very enlightened by what you said. Can I ask you a question? You, you mentioned that your MP, you haven't seen them. They've never been there. Let me throw it back to you. Um, that this is, a, this is a democracy. You can bang on their door and knock on it until it comes down. You can kick their door down, literally, at their constituency office. You can write to them. You can, you can make them listen to you. I just, I'm just being kind of a slight devil's advocate. So I get a lot of people, I have heard this on the doorstep, I never see you. Clearly there are 100,000 constituents, uh, 80,000 constituents in my, uh, my area. I can't see all of them, but I understand what they mean. It's that you're removed and you're distant. But, you know, I think one of the things about the bill, the police crime and sentencing bill, and also about, I um, mean, if we look at some of the stuff there about making it harder to vote and so on, some of this is about disenfranchising people and making them feel marginalised and alienated and outside of the political system because then they're easier to marginalise, they're easier to kind of uh, oppress, frankly. Um, and, and I just wonder, just throw that at you that actually, don't wait for your MP to come to you, go to them. I did. I was 16 the first time I, I uh, approached my MP for an issue that was very personal. You know what? Didn't get a response. My neighbouring MP was, was very helpful. Um, and the intervention meant that that we won on a case we, we were campaigning on. Um, I've done it. I've sat in the rooms with them. It makes no, it, it hasn't made a difference. Um, and this is the sad part because, you know, how do I how do I turn around and I say to my nieces, nephews, you know what, engage in the system, it'll, it'll bring you benefits because you know what, all it does is further disenfranchise us. 
uh, you know, I'm in this position where I'm torn between two very different worlds. You know, people say, you know, if you just engage, it's, 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 it, it's not, it doesn't work. You know, do I think if we had a travel parliament that, you know, all of a sudden um, we'd have these masses of changes? Look at Diane Abbott. I, I really want to just see what changes have happened. Have, have we seen that? She, she still gets trashed in the newspaper, whichever way you look at it. Um, and, I, and I think this is where it becomes because you just go, you know what? And it's the same with my local authority. I bang on their doors all the time. What they do now is they just ignore me um, and they loop around and find a way not to engage. Um, it's, so it's this thing of like, and this is, this is it's easy for me within an education. There's people who don't have that, who have other things, like other things that they have to do that can't spend all that time. You know, we don't even see like campaigners, we don't see people come in and encourage people to vote. So why should I encourage people to vote for, for any party that's not going to, doesn't believe in you anyway? It's, it's just, and, and I want, I desperately want to believe in that system, but I can't, you know, we say, oh, the system's broken. The system isn't broken. The system is doing what it was designed to do. It, it's, you know, we make it out like these things are not intentional, but they are. And, you know, my grandparents came here 56 years ago. It makes no difference. Like, my grandmother stood and shook hands with the Queen. It made no difference to us. You know, Bernie Mongan died, was left, that he died in the barracks and was left rotting for three weeks. And the, the, the newspapers didn't want to acknowledge that he was a traveller. Instead, it was like he had a broad southern accent. Bernie was born in London, always lived here. You know, if, you're, if you do good, you're not a traveller. They, they, will, they will pull you away from that. But if you do wrong, the media will paint you in a certain image. You know, when we experience policing, there was a raid on a, a site a couple of weeks ago. They sent in about 300 police officers. They all marched in as a, as a um, like a battalion, to arrest one person. I have seen here um, the council coming in to repossess an empty plot. That took 100 police officers. Um, your experience in disproportionate policing. If they're going to raid, what do you know what they do? They'll raid every plot and arrest every male over the age of 12, 13, including 70 year old men. So we can't, you know, people say, oh, you know, you might experience disproportionate, like, oh, maybe the policing will become fair. No, it doesn't. Honestly, when I talk in an English accent, I don't get this. When I, when I, I, and I engaged with the police as part of my job, I didn't get that. But when I have this accent and when I'm in this home, that's when I experience that. So I can't, you know, like I can't in good faith tell my people to engage when you're going to experience that anyway. You know what? Protect yourself. Be, be insular. Look after your own people because this, the society isn't going to. Mm. And that's, it's sad, really. Thank you, Chelsea. I, I'm not going to start a conversation on this because this is how you feel and it's about listening to how you feel and where you are at the moment and what this bill will do um and it sounds to me that this bill will will further alienate and marginalize you and your community as it will other communities which i think is its intention you're saying it's in built it's part of the design whatever the framing of it is that's the design and and, and i hear that loud and clear um whether i agree with your conclusions or not is irrelevant that's how you feel and that's what this is about today um, can I just see where there is a thank you for that Chelsea and I'm just going to see whether anyone else that wants to come in make a point I can see some really good points in the chat um, which I hope people are following um, I don't know whether anyone uh, has got their hand up I can see Katrina with her hand up is there anyone else who has their hand up on the other side on the other page no Katrina do you want to come in and, and comment on that and I can see Zara and Emmanuel as well so I'll bring them in after thank you it was really to just say Chelsea thank you for being so candid Thank you for, and we have to keep saying thank you because every time you do it, it takes a toll. It takes a toll. Um, and I totally understand what you say about why you don't know what to say to your nieces and nephews or friends about how we engage with the system because what the system tends to do is tie you out so that communities get tired, then there gets a bit of a stop and then you decide to disengage or that the person you engage in with within the system moves on and you have to start that relationship again. And it's as though there's a 
corporate memory drain, but rarely it's not because it's like amnesia. It's really there. They haven't forgotten even if that person's moved on. And that is incredibly tiring. So I really want to say thank you to Chelsea for echoing that because we don't often hear that. You know, as you said, the 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 the, the framing of the the, the issue around gypsy traveler lifestyle is is problematic and it's not because it's problematic it's because that's how they frame it so I think it's really important that you've spoken out and also highlighted that conundrum and that paradox of wanting to serve and do better but recognizing that the system actually when you do it you find yourself being curtailed and then getting very tired and then deciding actually I don't know how I can make a difference and I think that feeling is felt by lots of people in racialized minoritized communities and that's what makes getting some campaigns really difficult off the ground or having that sustainability is because people run out of steam and they just want to live good lives. They don't want to have to tackle racism because it's costly and it's tiring. So I'll end by just saying really thank you for contributing that because also from a women's perspective, which often is missed in these debates, is the intersectionality and the harm that will be done. So um, thank you for your contribution, Chelsea. Very cool. Sarah and Emmanuel, you put your hand up. Oh, thanks. Hi. Yeah, my name is Manuel. I'm speaking from Liberty. Um, yeah, also wanted to echo what, what's been said already. And, and thanks to, to Chelsea, Stefan and Anthony. Um, one thing that just to kind of tie the, the conversations that Chelsea and Stefan and Anthony were having um, together a bit as well is I think it's really important that we understand the threat that I think Chelsea was alluding to earlier that Black and Gypsy and Traveller communities represent on, on the system and on our society. Because if we're calling for accessible housing on the one hand, or you know, if we're refusing to abide by the logic of capitalism by sharing childcare amongst our families, then that's a threat on the very system that's then propped up by cultural tropes and racism that makes those very demands look radical when they're not at all. And I think, you know, when we look at the ways and the tools that the bill is using to wage an attack on marginalized communities. So in the case of gypsy and traveler communities, it's by trying to dismantle the very way of life that nomadic communities have been living and the ways in which the serious violence production orders and the serious violence duty is threatening people's friendships and the music they listen to, the association they keep, their family lives. You have to understand that, there, that there's a logic to that that is about disrupting the status quo and, the, and, and waging a direct attack on our ways of living and community, you know, being in community with each other that as a result threatens the, system, the very system itself. Thank you, Emmanuel. Is there anyone else that would like to come in before I move to, to the closing remarks? Anyone else? Can I see any hands going up? Uh, Sandra, Sandra, I see your hand up. And also Elsa, Elsa's clapping. So Sandra, would you like to um, say a few words? Uh, yes, I'd just like to ask the question. The point has been made before by the Criminal Justice Alliance and others about the impact of the, this bill on uh, marginalised community and uh, on marginalised communities. And the government have basically come back and said, yes, we know, and that, that's tough. So uh, where do you think we are going to stand after this event, please? Uh, is that a question to any particular any particular contributor or? Well, ideally to yourself, Clive. <laughs> okay, maybe I can address that before we go on to remark uh, closing remarks. Um, does anyone else have their hand up? No? Okay, so we can move on to that. And I, and I can start with that. So first of all, before I come on to that question, I'll, I'll, I'll address that in the closing remarks. Um, can I just thank all of our contributors today because it's exceptionally difficult sometimes to be able to, to speak uh, on these issues in this forum. And I, I thank them so much for what they've said. Um, and I, I really hope that what they've said can feed into the work that we do here on the APPG on race and community and somehow find its way, it will find its way into how we deal with this, with the police and crime uh, sentencing bill. So thank you very much for your contributions. I will say that I did know the tone of despondency in there, and I can, I can completely empathize and understand it because I think it's a, a sentiment that politically many of us are feeling at the moment. Um, but it's not one that I personally, and I can say this, I speak from a very privileged position and got, can I, have the, uh, have the have the opportunity really to allow to kind of overtake what I do 
Um, but I understand it's different for everyone. And I understand that if you're on the sharp end of this, that despondency is something which I understand uh, is a daily part and a, an integral part of your experience and your life. Um, I hope that from what you've told us today, we can really utilize and use what you've said in how we engage with this. I think in terms of your question, Sandra, where will we be after this? If this bill goes through as is, we will all be in a worse position. I think we have to understand the kind of government that we have at the moment. I don't think we've actually ever seen anything like it. We're seeing the, the organization of politics, if you want, which is um, an anti-democratic, racist, uh, authoritarian government. Just because it's a British government, democratically elected, doesn't mean it, doesn't, it isn't able to, sh to, to show those characteristics. I think it does. And I think this bill is part of that. I think the attack on democracy, the attack on minorities, um, the, the, the bill that was passed yesterday, privatizing yet greatest ways of the NHS, there is a concerted attack. This is what the conservative, this is what conservative governments do, but there's also a failure of opposition parties to be able to actually stand up and whenever they do come into power to put in place checks and balances, which fundamentally shift the balance of power within our society and our economy. And that hasn't happened, frankly, for 60 years. Um, that needs to happen as a matter of urgency. I can't tell you hand on heart that I think our current front bench is going to do that, but that's my personal view. Nonetheless, it's really important that after this bill, I think people can really see the lay of the land um, and understand that we have a, a government that isn't just attacking individual small groups here and there. It's a collective attack, and it's one of the most fundamental attacks on our civil liberties and our democracy that I think we've seen um, for a number of decades. So after this, I'm not quite sure uh, where you think um, we as a campaign will be, but I think the battle lines will be clearly drawn. And ultimately, many within our communities will be in a worse off position, uh, but they won't be alone. And I think for me, the key thing that I took, for example, from the COP26 um, uh, event in Scotland, where I sat on a panel with people from the Philippines, from South Africa, one of the most unequal societies in the world, the Philippines has a hard right authoritarian uh, gangster basically running the Philippines. The thing that came out of it, the, the battle cry, if you want, from COP26, was that marginalized communities, both in this country and abroad, need to show solidarity with one another. It's a word sometimes that becomes quite twee, but actually I think it's a word, I think it's a sentiment that we have to understand that the fight of the travelers, the fight of poor, of, of poor black communities in this country, of people around the world who are oppressed, by these governments, these decisions, these policies need to stand together. I don't think anyone can, can argue with that. I can't see any other alternative apart from that. Um, one of the things I think I will say and conclude with um, was that it feels to me, and I think this was a point being picked up by Stefan and others, was that what we're seeing is a criminalization with this bill, a criminalization of social problems, uh, much of whose genesis stems from social and economic policy decisions of successive governments. We've seen that in the US. We've also seen in the US, and I think it's a, a leaf that's taken out by this government, we've seen how racism has morphed into criminalization. That if you actually want to pursue racist policies, then you criminalize those groups uh, and make their very existence criminal. Uh, and I think that's increasingly what's happened. I also think that we cannot get away from the fact that the uh, the, the growing amount of resource that is going into the police is being done at the same time that resource is being taken out of housing, of affordable housing, of social care, of an NHS, of our NHS, of the very social fabric of our society. The two are interlinked and they go hand in hand. Uh, and I think, as someone has already mentioned, this is in many ways a distraction so that people can say, look over there and it, takes away from what's happening over here. But I wanted to thank everyone for their contributions today. I wanted to thank everyone that's uh, made points, uh, raised questions uh, and had their say today. Um, and this has been extremely useful for us here at Runnymede in how, and the APPG in how we'll take this forward and how we'll, uh, we'll write this up. I also um, have seen that people have asked whether a copy of this recording will be made available. If you've registered, then we should have your email and I'm sure we can share this with you so that you can share on your networks uh, and use as you see fit. Uh, but aside from that, thank you for your contributions. Thank you for turning up. It's a fantastic turnout today. Uh, and thank you uh, 
for listening so uh, carefully to the eloquent speakers that we've had. Thank you very much.